has never been about me. It's about you. A journey has begun. Over a million Americans are moving to take their place at the presidential inauguration of Barack Obama. Each individual comes for his or her own reasons, and each with a story to tell. For many, the day marks the end of weeks of preparation and planning. For businessman and philanthropist Earl Stafford, inaugural plans took a unique turn when a family member read about a million dollar offer from a local hotel. My brother-in-law was at the kitchen table. I heard him blurt out, can you imagine that someone would pay a million dollars for a hotel package at the JW Marriott Hotel? And I knew right then that's what the Lord wanted me to do. They had 300 rooms that we could bring in individuals and, and to house them there. Uh, certainly this was grander and greater than anything that I, I had imagined. We were looking to bring in those who were in homeless shelters, those who were in battered women's shelters, the elderly. We actually teamed up with and partnered with 35 different socially responsible organizations throughout the nation. And so the People's Inaugural Project was born. The plan was simply to give it all away. This event has hit and it's exploded and, uh, and it's evolved, but we're still staying focusing on trying to do just a little good. And this is our feeble effort to uh, try to do good in America and inspire others to do the same. I'm from Memphis, Is that right? In At Gramlin State University, the Hot Stepping Tiger Marching Band was practicing and preparing their instruments. Many have died to just get to the point where we are now. And so it is just really exciting and an honor to be a part of the inauguration. I really look up to Barack Obama, so it'll, it'll mean a lot to me to actually go out there and get, the, uh, get to see the people that's inspired by his speaking and stuff. Back in Washington, it's time for Elaine Weber to choose a dress for the ball. I ended up being worthless and homeless. It wasn't until the alcohol was completely removed was I able to tap back into, oh yeah, I, I, I didn't want to be an alcoholic. <laughs> and I had an opportunity to meet some of the uh, uh, individuals from the N Street Village here in Washington, the uh, women's homeless shelter and uh, they were so excited, so elated, that they were really inspiring to all that came in contact with them. This is purple, it's too small, like too small. We knew that we wanted to bring individuals in who were underserved and disadvantaged. We wanted to have a celebration, we wanted to have a ball. And I mentioned that to my wife and my daughter, and they immediately said, well, if we're gonna bring these ladies in, then they have to be elegant. And so we want them to have gowns and makeup art. And my wife and my daughter started commiserating, and I was out of the picture after that. Beautiful. No, it's just the jacket stuff. Yeah, these are just pieces here. This is cute. It, there were so, so many dresses to choose from. Our objective is to outfit these women to be uh, the belle of the ball. Here I am. Uh-uh. <laughs> 
<laughs> to have an opportunity to wear beautiful gowns, to be able to accessorize, to find shoes, uh, all of the things it takes to be an inaugural ball the way you always dreamed you'd like to be, but may not have had the opportunity to be. Yeah, I'm going to come out and show you. They are just in awe of being able to pick and choose for themselves whatever their heart desires. This, this is the dress that I really, 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 really want. These men and women came in and selected the uh, 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 apparel that they wanted, and they could take them home. They got to keep these. So it was, um, it was hard to pick. Sorry, neither one of them fit. <laughs> It's hard to pick, but I did find the one that I, I really love. I think I've got it. <laughs> I'm really grateful for it. Because I was like, what am I going to wear? It's the day before the inauguration, and in New York City, it's time for an American hero to catch his train. My daughter and I were at the March in Washington in 1963. I look forward to seeing. The train is coming in. I'm getting ready to get on. It really is gratifying to realize that many people uh, have gotten past the obvious parts of prejudice and discrimination and are bringing their kids and their relatives to celebrate a new president, a president who brings hope. Just like John F. Kennedy brought hope, Barack Obama brings hope. But it really is gratifying to me to be participating in this and to see so many people, so many backgrounds coming to this inauguration. I flew 68 combat missions. I got shot at at every European capital except uh, London and Paris. So that's not a pleasant experience. On the other hand, you know you're defending your country. You know as you're defending your country, you're also projecting your race. So it was a combination of pride and a feeling of accomplishment. The Tuskegee Airmen showed that African Americans as a group could achieve great things. The sun breaks through. That's really apocryphal. Just as we arrive, the sun breaks through. Okay, thank you. The victory was a victory for America, not just for African Americans. Ooh, don't slip. There we are. All right, we made it. Our family has very strong Obama ties, although they sometimes chastise me for initially supporting uh, Senator Clinton. What? Now the real fun, now the real fun begins. You got that right. The reality of the world is that when you work with a senator, and I work with her, and they had done some things that supported our community, your initial uh, thrust was to support them. After she uh, was defeated, Obama became the candidate. There was no question about my support for his candidacy. Hey, How you doing? Oh, my God. Oh, what a trip. What a trip. You made it. You made it. I kept waiting and waiting. On the bus, which is really, I think, inspirational because a lot of this started on the bus. We're just excited to be celebrating the first black president in American history. It just means so much to us, and we're going to just so I can tell my kids about it and my grandkids going forward. I was a real little girl when Martin Luther King. Um, had this historic march and the civil rights and as a little girl I can remember discrimination I can remember not being able to go places and so to be able to have this be a part of my lifetime and to share it with my child means a lot. We are about to walk in about six miles to get to uh, downtown DC, down to the Capitol area, down to Pennsylvania Avenue, where I'm gonna be unfolding, hopefully, if I get through security, some banners that uh, are asking Barack Obama to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. We need to be down at Pennsylvania Avenue by 6.30, so we're gonna be hoofing it. Oh, I've already parked my car. Yeah, just to, just to speed up the walking. I've been walking for a while. It's just taking me longer than I thought. We started 
uh, last Friday, and uh, so we've been on the road. We couldn't get out at first because of 80 mile per hour winds back in Kodiak, so our trip was delayed by about 12 hours, but it's been a long time coming. I think we're probably going to be somewhere around here. The big word is change, um, and we came this far because uh, it was something we wanted to be a part of. So it is 6.30 in the morning on Tuesday, and we are getting ready to head to the metro station. Uh, my friends and family have been texting me and calling me for all three hours that I got sleep, telling me that the metro station is an absolute zoo and nobody can get through and they're not letting people on anymore. So we'll see how actually truthful that statement is. So, we just uh, finally made it out of the metro station. First actual light of day we've seen in about two hours. Looks like we came out right by the uh, house office building. So here we are, we finally made it to our seats. Uh, you can see that the podium is just right there, about one to two hundred yards away from us, uh, thanks to the great tickets from Congressman Tom Rooney. It has been a not phenomenal. I mean, nobody's pushing anybody. Everybody's being very polite. Um, it was crazy getting in. We left our house at five. It took us probably three hours just to physically get on the mall because of all of the changes and where we could walk and where we couldn't walk. But we were determined. We were determined that we were going to be here. Uh, President-elect Obama shows up. This crowd is going to explode. I, just, just the anticipation for him is unreal. Unreal. After he was elected, I said, I got to go. <laughs> I said, I don't care what. I got to go. fabulous to be here with my dad when I was 15. I didn't know I was making history then, but I'm so grateful for it. That's one of my best memories of me and my dad, um, you know, here and being under a tree, you know, near the reflecting pool, listening to Martin Luther King. And so I, I, it's just fabulous. I, I'm going to tear up, I'm sure. I can't believe it. You know, here we are and Barack is going to be sworn in and um, I'm with my dad again, making history in D.C. Happy Inauguration Day! her trouble down. I don't know how my father stood his ground. I don't know how my people survived slavery. I do remember that's why I believe. I wrote that song and the song says that I stand in this place as evidence of everything that has come before me. During those early days as a participant in the movement, I was beaten, lighted cigarette was put out in my hair, down my back, but I never gave up, I never gave in, I never became bitter or hostile. The way of nonviolence, the way of peaceful resistance, the way of Gandhi, the way of Martin Luther King Jr. was our way, our mean, achieving our goal. As a young student, I accepted nonviolence, not simply as a technique, as a tactic, but as a way of life, as a way of living. We wanted to change America and change America forever to bring about a truly 
interracial democracy in America to create a more perfect union? When I'm asked when I started in the civil rights struggle, I realized that I pr probably got my first lead into it when I was a junior in high school. And I found myself not talking about anything else but the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments of the Constitution. And I am 96 today. And since that day, I've still been working to make the 14th Amendment assure equal justice under the law to all people. What I really worked is one of what we call the United Civil Rights Leadership with Dr. King and Roy Wilkins and A. Philip Randolph and Whitney Young, and John Lewis. On Sunday morning, 7, 1965, 600 of us line up to walk in an orderly, peaceful, nonviolent fashion all the way from Selma to Montgomery. We were walking in twos, no one saying a word. We came to the edge of the bridge, the Edmund Pettus Bridge, crossing the Alabama River. And we made up our mind that we were going to walk with dignity and with pride all the way. In less than a minute and a half, the major said, troopers advance. And you saw these men put in on their gas masks. They came toward us, beating us with night sticks, bull whips, tramping us with horses, releasing the tear gas. I was hit in the head by a state trooper with a night stick. I thought I saw death. I thought I was going to die. I had a concussion at the bridge. But that Sunday that became known as Bloody Sunday galvanized support for voting rights around the nation and forced an American president Lyndon Johnson to speak to a joint session of the Congress and introduce the Voting Rights Act. And before he concluded that speech, he said, and we shall overcome, and we shall overcome. I was so aware of everything that was happening in terms of race in the country. My father watched the news every day. I still remember when my parents registered vote. There was a voter registration drive in the 50s in my county and in the city of Albany. And the black men who ran that drive were harassed by the police. And on August 28, 1963, when we had the March on Washington, and I looked out and saw some 250,000 people. It was hard to believe that we had amassed so many people. And if I respect the living, dying struggle of those who have come before me, it will be evidenced in what I do with the breath I am allowed to breathe. Guide my feet while I run this race, guide my feet while I run this race. Oh, We've come a long way, but we're not all the way there yet. But we, with this election, I think the country has moved to a, a higher level. Obama will not be the president for African Americans, but for everyone. It is my hope and it's my prayer that more people will follow the leadership of Barack Obama. Maybe, just maybe, he would teach us how to lay down the differences and how to work together for the common good. I run this race. Oh, I don't want to run this race in vain. So many of the World War II veterans are not here, but that is what we really fought for. 
to free America, to rid them of segregation prejudice where we could all live together. I had to be here. This is the greatest moment of my life. Ladies and gentlemen, Mrs. Marion Robinson and the daughters of the president-elect, Malia Obama and Sasha Obama, accompanied by Assistant Secretary of the Senate, Sheila Dwyer. I didn't know where I was going to stay. I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't know anything. But I got on the plane and I came here. I walked in and I was telling them, you know, I'm a war, disabled World War II veteran. I'm 88 years old. And just about that time, Mr. Stafford walked, walked around the corner. See how God worked? When I saw this veteran in a, um, uh, an Army uniform, an old Army uniform, and they introduced him as Mr. Sherman, and he was a World War II veteran. Wanted to take a couple of minutes and just respectfully listen to his story. He said, oh, let me shake your hand. He had come in from Los Angeles, and he didn't have a place to stay. He said, where are you staying? I said, I don't know. And he said, well, from now until you leave here, you're my honored guest. Oh, my God! Look at him! Look at him! Look at him! Look at him! He knows, he knows how to put it on. He knows how to put it on. That's right. He knows how he's got it. Ladies and gentlemen, the president elect of the United States, Barack Obama. the Chief Justice of the United States, the Honorable John G. Roberts, Jr., who will administer the presidential oath of office. Everyone, please stand. Prepared to take the oath, Senator? I am. I, Barack Hussein Obama, I, do Barack, solemnly swear. I, Barack Hussein Obama, do solemnly swear. That I will execute the office of President to the United States faithfully. That I will execute the off faithfully the, pres the office of President of the, the United States. The office of President of the United States faithfully. And will to the best of my ability. And will to the best of my ability. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. Congratulations, Mr. President. Yeah. 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 My fellow citizens, I stand here today humbled by the task before us, grateful for the trust you have bestowed, mindful of the sacrifices borne by our ancestors. Today I say to you that the challenges we face are real. They are serious and they are many. They will not be met easily or in a short span of time. But know this, America, they will be met. We 
remain a young nation. But in the words of Scripture, the time has come to set aside childish things. The time has come to reaffirm our enduring spirit, to choose our better history, to carry forward that precious gift, that noble idea passed on from generation to generation, the God-given promise that all are equal, all are free, and all deserve a chance to pursue their full measure of happiness. Our capacity remains undiminished, but our time of standing pat of protecting narrow interests and putting off unpleasant decisions, that time has surely passed. Starting today, we must pick ourselves up, dust ourselves off, and begin again the work of remaking America. What the cynics fail to understand is that the ground has shifted beneath them, that the stale political arguments that have consumed us for so long no longer apply. The question we ask today is not whether our government is too big or too small, but whether it works, whether it helps families find jobs at a decent wage, care they can afford, a retirement that is dignified. Where the answer is yes, we intend to move forward. Where the answer is no, programs will end. As for our common defense, we reject as false the choice between our safety and our ideals. Our founding, fathers, our founding fathers faced with perils that we can scarcely imagine drafted a charter to assure the rule of law and the rights of man, a charter expanded by the blood of generations. Those ideals still light the world, and we will not give them up for expedience's sake. And so, to all the other peoples and governments who are watching today, from the grandest capitals to the small village where my father was born, know that America is a friend of each nation and every man, woman, and child who seeks a future of peace and dignity. And we are ready to lead once more. We will not apologize for our way of life, nor will we waver in its defense. And for those who seek to advance their aims by inducing terror and slaughtering innocents, we say to you now that our spirit is stronger and cannot be broken. You, you cannot, cannot outlast us, and we will defeat you. <laughs> to the Muslim world, we seek a new way forward based on mutual interest and mutual respect. To those leaders around the globe who seek to sow conflict or blame their society's ills on the West, know that your people will judge you on what you can build, not what you destroy. To those, to those who cling to power through corruption and deceit and the silencing of dissent, know that you are on the wrong side of history, but that we will extend a hand if you are willing to unclench your fist. What is required of us now is a new era of responsibility, a recognition on the part of every American that we have duties to ourselves, our nation, and the world, duties that we do not grudgingly accept but rather seize gladly, firm in the knowledge that there is nothing so satisfying to the spirit, so defining of our character, than giving our all to a difficult task. This is the meaning of our liberty and our creed. Why? Men and women and children of every race and every faith can join in celebration across this magnificent mall. And why a man whose father less than 60 years ago might not have been served at a local restaurant can now stand before you to take a most sacred oath. Let it be said by our children's children that when we were tested, we refused to let this journey end, that we did not turn back nor did we falter. And with eyes fixed on the horizon and God's grace upon us, we carried forth that great gift of freedom and delivered it safely to future generations. Thank you. God bless you. And God bless the United States of America.
Barack Obama cookies. Barack Obama. 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 Hot chocolate, hot shake. The parade will start toward 9th Street. The parade will start toward 9th Street. Obama. Everybody around here is feeling very celebratory. People are dancing, people are having as good a time as you can have when it feels like it's 11 degrees outside. is now approaching the, the, the crosswalk, the brown brick yeah, crosswalk. Yeah, 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 yeah. Three, two, oh, one. So he's right here. Yeah, he's looking down there. No. Yeah. I got blocked by a press van. I'll send him a postcard. Obama. 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 Don't get tired. You, this is once in a lifetime. What was really inspiring, I wanted my grandchildren. I had all four of my grandchildren there. <laughs> all these limos the and all wine gets out. Yeah. My nine-year-old granddaughter, Madeline Michelle, we wanted this ingrained in their memory and etched in their hearts that they knew that this was a special occasion. Biden's coming. Somehow it's just not the same thing, but I hope he does get out. That's the vice president. Today, I say to you that the challenges we face are real. They are serious and they are many. They will not be met easily or in a short span of time. But know this, America, they will be met. Barack Obama is taking the presidency and, and leading the nation at, a, at probably one of the gravest times in his history. I think it's going to be tough. I don't think it's going to be easy. You know, I think. Uh, you know, we, we, we've got ourselves in quite a deep hole and, you know, we're just going to have to take a small step at a time. And, you know, I, I really hope that, you know, at, at least at the end of the four years, we've got the positive momentum and, you know, use the later four years to really, you know, accelerate. So, you know, we gotta, we got to get back to where we were and, and then rebuild and, you know, I think we'll get there. But it's going to be slow. I don't think it's, it's not going to happen overnight. Ideas are great. Hope is great. But finally, the test is what you're able to do through the Congress, what you're able to do through the economy. The greatest fear for Obama is the fact that his expectations are so high he might not be able to meet all of them. And it's pretty clear that he won't be able to meet all of them. He's going to try to meet most of them. What is the reality? I mean, we're, we're still at war. We have that to clean up and, and move on with. Um, our economy is probably the worst it's been since the Great Depression, possibly worse by some standards. And, uh, you know, there are, there are many other issues that we were already dealing with, those being the two biggest, plus Homeland Security issues. Actually, leadership now is probably more difficult than it was when I was a young man. We knew we had a defined objective. We had to beat racism, we had to beat segregation. 
Now there's so many objectives that you have to deal with. You have to deal with the economy, you have to deal with international affairs, you have to deal with the environment. And the expectations are much higher. If we want to build a sense of community where you bring people together in spite of your differences, where you can work together and create a powerful, unified administration, he's doing the right thing. It's a good thing. If this country is going to rise up to its greatness, one man is not going to do it. He can inspire, he can lead, but it's up to us as a people to change the world. We can't relegate that responsibility to any one man, regardless of how great we think he is. Everyone must play a part and do a part in changing the world. When we talk about celebration of the inaugural, there's always a ball. We're gonna have a good time tonight, okay? We are, we are, we're gonna, we're absolutely. Just let it loose. We're gonna, what did you say, Mary? Air it out. Air it out. <laughs> We wanted to have the same magnitude and intensity and, and the same venue as, as the other balls for our invited guests who otherwise would never have ha had an opportunity to attend an inaugural ball. Just going to the ball, heck, I, I think we would have been cool if we would, would had jeans on. Hard to believe that, that today I would um, we're going to a ball hosted by a gentleman that says that we can all have another chance. To, to see all the beautiful gowns that they had and, um, and all the sparkles and, and um, colors and jewelry to match. There was just a certain electric spirit that was in the air. It's one of the greatest moments of my life. Everyone was on one accord, no disagreements. Everyone was focused, uh, uh, courteous, helpful. It, you know, it was almost like a foretaste of glory divine. First of all, how, how good looking is my wife? Thanks for watching. If you like this video, check out these other videos from USA Today to stay up to date with all the latest news.